All right, so I'd like to thank the organizing committee for this opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you to Fabrice and thank you to Donald for laying such a wonderful stage and setting up the stage for the clinical data for these agents that are currently in development. These are my disclosures. So let me start by actually walking you through the key milestones in the treatment of ER-positive metastatic breast cancer. It was nearly 100 years ago that Sir George Beetson showed us the benefits of oophorectomy and how effective it was in ER-positive disease, a finding that has led to the use of endocrine therapy. It was in the 1950s that Elwood Jensen described an entity that we call the estrogen receptor today. It was in the late 1970s that we had approval for the very first endocrine agent, a serum estrogen receptor modulator tamoxifen. We then had aromatase inhibitors get approved for postmenopausal women in the 1990s. And then it was not until 2010 that we learned the right dosing schedule for the only approved serum estrogen receptor down regulator, Fulvestrant. And since then, in the last decade, we've been following the current trend of utilizing endocrine agents as backbones alongside novel targeted therapies, initially with the approval of Evolimus, an uh, mTORC inhibitor in 2012. And between 2015 and 2019, we have the CDK4-6 inhibitors that got approved. Most recently, we have approvals for alpelacib and alpha-specific PIGK inhibitor. So let's start with reviewing how does hormone receptor signaling really work. So the estrogen receptor has the AF1 function domain, so it's an activating function one domain, a ligand binding or an activating function two domain, and a DNA binding domain. And the receptor is complexed with HSP90, which maintains the receptor in an off state. When estradiol binds to the ligand binding domain, it triggers the release from HSP90, which then causes receptor dimerization and DNA engagement, then causing coordinated recruitment of cofactors and transcriptional machinery, which drives the gene expression changes. And there are three approved strategies to target ER that are currently available to our patients in clinic, including serum estrogen receptor modulators or tamoxifen, that compete with estradiol to bind with the estrogen receptor. They have agonistic or antagonistic capabilities in a tissue-specific fashion, and they lead to inhibition of the ER transcription. We have aromatase inhibitors that prevent the conversion or inhibit the conversion from androgens to estrogens. And then we have serum estrogen receptor down regulators of fulvestrin, which not only inhibits ER transcription, but also degrades or down regulates the ER receptor itself. But while these agents are very effective and work for our patients, they do have their limitations, which are not limited just to their toxicity profile. For example, under the selective pressure of aromatase inhibitors, we do see acquisition of ESR1 mutations in the metastatic setting, and this leads to ligand-independent activation of ER transcription activity. Now, tamoxifen can also be a partial agonist, which can manifest as weaker ER suppression. And while fulvestrant is active after progression on prior endocrine therapy, including in some ESR1 mutant patients, its efficacy is limited because of its dose dependency, and it has some poor PK profile, lack of bioavailability, and recently data has suggested that single-agent fulvestrant can cause a median progression-free survival of just two months post-CDK4-6 inhibitor therapy, and additionally, its activity can be limited in certain ESR1 mutations, especially Y537S, which is one of the two most common ESR1 mutations that we see. Lastly, there is non-adherence that we see, which is a big issue in the early stage setting due to toxicity-related reasons. And in fact, a population-based study by Don Hirschman and colleagues showed that only 50% of the patients were adherent to the five-year of endocrine therapy in the early stage. So how can we do better? How can we circumvent these issues of toxicity and this therapeutic liabilities of these currently approved endocrine agents? This has led to the premise of developing newer endocrine agents, such as novel oral CERTs, next generation serum estrogen receptor modulators, serum CERT hybrids. We now also have um, complete estrogen receptor antagonist or CRAN. We have CERCA, which is serum estrogen receptor covalent antagonist and PROTAX, which are proteolysis targeting chimera. But the goal here of developing all of these agents really 
is that we want to down-regulate ER with an agent that has the most optimal therapeutic index and superior efficacy so that we can further improve outcomes and overcome the issues we face in clinic. Let's see. There you go. So let's start with oral certs. I think the key advantages of oral certs are one, that they are an or oral formulation, and that they have high potency when compared to fluvestrin and preclinical models. And activity for these agents was also seen preclinically in ESR1 mutant cell lines and PDX models, including with BIFI37S, which was resistant to fluvestrin. And talking about ESR1 mutations, they can be rare in the first-line metastatic setting, but the prevalence can be as high as 40% as detected in circulating tumor DNA in endocrine refractory setting. And this is a table that summarizes 10 active oral certs that are currently in clinical development, and I've highlighted the top five on this table that are already in phase three trials. Now, shown here are the swimmer's plots for select CERD in phase one trials. Now, these are trials where patients were treated heterogeneously with prior therapies, but what I'd like to draw your attention is to the dotted lines that you see here across these trials, which is the six-month time point. And despite these prior therapies, which are heterogeneous, and despite prior endocrine therapy and chemotherapy, you see that there is a subpopulation of these patients that stay on therapy beyond the six-month time point which kind of tells you that if they could work in a refractory setting, perhaps the activity could be more robust even in a naive setting. And to provide further granularity for efficacy from these phase one trials, this is a table summarizing that data. Drawing your attention to prior CDK4-6 uh, inhibitor therapy across these trials, about 50 to 60% had had prior CDK4-6 inhibitor therapy. About 60% had prior full Western therapy. Again, this varied from trial to trial. And as in everything, the response rate in ER-positive breast cancer is rather low, but the clinical benefit rate, as shown here, is about 35 to 50% across these trials for these drugs. This table here summarizes oral CERD plus, or it's grouping oral CERDs with CDK4-6 inhibitors from phase one trials by pretreatment, really. So the top two here highlighted are the Novartis oral CERD with ribociclib and the AstraZeneca CERD with palbociclib where patients had had 35 or 70 percent um, prior CDK4-6 inhibitor respectively, or about 60 percent prior full Western-based therapy. And in those patients, the clinical benefit rate was about 35 to 50 percent. In the middle, you have the G1 therapeutics compound with palbociclib, and with 15 percent of the patients with prior full Western, the clinical benefit rate here was 60 percent. And for the last two agents here from Sanofi and Genentech, along with palbociclib, which were predominantly CDK4-6 and full Western naive, you see that the clinical benefit rate here is about 75 to 80%. So here are a few things that we would want to learn from this. One, that these drugs are active. Two, that these drugs can be combined with CDK4-6. And while they can have activity even post-CDK4-6, they would be a good partner with CDK4-6 in the first-line setting. And this is what we actually see now that is happening in clinic. In phase three trials, these drugs are being evaluated in combination with CDK4-6 against our current standard of care AI plus CDK4-6. They're also being evaluated post-CDK4-6 inhibitor therapy in comparison to um, standard of care physician choice endocrine therapy, and also with many other targeted therapeutic options that are all summarized on this slide. They're rapidly also being evaluated in early stage setting, and in fact, early data from the window of opportunity portion of a neoadjuvant trial, the COOPERATA trial, presented by Sarah Hurwitz at ESMO, suggested that there was a greater key 67 reduction at two weeks with oral surgeritestran compared to anastrozole, and a higher complete cell cycle arrest was also seen in that study. And adjuvant phase three trials with this compound and others are either planned or have already begun accrual. Now, this morning, we heard the results of the Emerald trial that compared Elasa Strand, presented by Aditya Bardia in the general session. Now, just a quick reminder, the Emerald trial enrolled patients who had no more than two lines of endocrine therapy and no more than one line of um, chemotherapy, and they were randomized to receiving Elasa Strand versus physician choice endocrine therapy 
for co-primary endpoints of progression-free survival in all patients and progression-free survival in mutant ESR1. And these are the primary endpoint results, the Kaplan-Meier curves. On your left is the data for all patients they intend to treat, where elacistrant was associated with a 30% reduction in the risk of progression or death in all patients with ER-positive HER2-negative breast cancer. The median progression-free survival improved from 1.9 to 2.8. The hazard ratio was 0.69, which was significant. On your right are the data for patients whose tumor harbor mutant ESR1. And here, elacistrant was associated with a 45% reduction in the risk of progression or death, and the progression-free survival doubled from 1.9 months to 3.8 months. Similar results were seen when elacistrant was compared to fulvestrant. About 70% of this patient population had uh, been treated with fulvestrant in the control arm, and even there you saw similar results in intent to treat and in the mutant um, ESR1 population. But what was really interesting was actually the, the result of the PFS rates at 6 to 12 months. As you can see, there's an early drop-off that you see in both arms in the first two months, which is perhaps related to the endocrine resistance, primary and secondary. But once you have the endocrine-sensitive patient population, you see the separation of the curves. But more importantly, the PFS rates at both 6 months and 12 months was higher in the elacistrant arm compared to the standard of uh, endocrine therapy arm. So what about the side effects with these agents? Now, we do not see the regular deep vein thrombosis or endometrial cancers that we've seen with tamoxifen. But what we see here most commonly is gastrointestinal side effects, namely nausea and diarrhea. For example, in the Emerald trial, the most important treatment alert uh, related uh, emergent adverse event was nausea, which was predominantly grade one or two. We also see fatigue, which we see with many anti-cancer therapies. We see some arthralgia and hot flashes. And we also see some unique side effects such as bradycardia and visual disturbances with some of these compounds, the pathophysiology of which is really unknown. So what is the key takeaway from oral certs? I think oral certs are active in the metastatic setting and they're generally safe and well tolerable with some unique side effects that we still have to yet understand, but they are grade one. They are effective post CDK4-6 inhibitors and in mutant ESR1 uh, population. We know that there is a clinical unmet need post CDK4-6 inhibitor therapy. The current progression-free survival with single agent fulvestrant in this setting is approximately two months based on the Veronica trial that has been reported out. And from the Emerald trial presented by Dr. Bardia, we saw a statistically significant but a modest increment in PFS compared to the current approved endocrine therapy in second or third line metastatic setting. The PFS was higher in the mutant ESR1 patient population, and the PFS rates were higher at the 6 and 12 month time point, which was reassuring. Data for other certs in the same setting are awaited, and it is possible that th this might be a new standard of care for this subgroup of patients who might be appropriate for treatment with single agent endocrine therapy post CDK4-6 inhibitor therapy. But like what we do in clinic today, where we try and even use combination strategies, we do require combination strategies to further improve outcomes with these agents as well post CDK4-6. There are some unanswered questions in the metastatic setting. One being, can we delay the emergence of ESR1 mutation? Does the endocrine therapy really matter in combination with CDK4-6 inhibitors when utilized in the first-line metastatic setting? We have phase three trials already ongoing with oral thirds with CDK4-6, comparing them to AI with CDK4-6. And I'd call your attention to the PARA trial, which is going to be presented by Francois Bedard tomorrow at the session. But there was a press release that came out yesterday, which suggested that there was a switch. When you have patients who switch with first-line AI palbociclib to full Western plus palbociclib due to ESR emergence, there was a doubling of PFS from 5.7 to 11.9 months. So we look forward to these data tomorrow. And similar strategy is already being utilized with oral certs from AstraZeneca, the Serena 6 trial that is currently enrolling. Now, will these agents become a partner of choice? for PI3K, AKT, mTOR inhibitors, especially if there is also a mutant ESR1 mutation. I think trials will suggest that and looks like that, that would be the wave of the future. And we need to understand the mechanisms of resistance for these agents as well, the way we understand a little bit about for chamoxifen AI and fulvestrant. What about unanswered questions in the early stage setting? 
would these agents be superior to all approved endocrine therapy in all comer patients? At least early data by um, Sarah Hurwitz, as we discussed from the cooperative trial, do suggest that the key 67 suppression was higher with oral CERT compared to AI. It is possible that there might be better adherence, possibly with some of these agents in the early stage setting. One advantage that we have with these agents is that dose reduction for a patient who cannot tolerate a given drug at a current approved dose is possible with these agents given the data that we have from metastatic um, trials. But we cannot do that with AI and tamoxifen in early stage patients. What about for our high risk patients? Should we be thinking about escalation strategies in combination with abemaciclib, or will single agent oral CERD be enough in this setting? What about optimal timing for our designs in, in early stage setting? Should we be thinking about upfront strategy where we just compare a CERD upfront to a AI or tamoxifen? Should we be considering switch strategies where patients first get AI or tamoxifen for two years and then are switched over to get an oral CERD? Or should we be thinking about delaying late distant recurrence and utilizing them as extended endocrine therapy? A lot of questions that we need to address and hopefully data from planned and ongoing trials will address these. Let's move on to novel next generation serum ester receptor modulators or CIRMs. Lasofoxifene is a next generation non-steroidal CIRM that was originally developed to treat vulvovaginal atrophy and osteoporosis. In fact, we got a lot of safety data from a very large phase three PEARL trial that evaluated over 8,600 patients to establish the safety. And this drug already has an FDA fast track designation. It binds to ER with a similar potency and similar fashion to estradiol and causes a conformational change that prevents recruitment of cofactors. It is effective in inhibiting metastases to the lung and liver in ESR1 mutant uh, models, and two trials have already completed accrual. The phase two Elaine trial, which compared lasofoxifene head-to-head -head with fulvestrant in ESR1 mutant patients, and then we also have the combination of lasofoxifene with abamaciclib in the Elaine two trial, and we're hoping to uh, hear the results from these studies, hopefully at ASCO next year. Moving on to bazidoxifene, which is a third generation non-steroidal CIRM. And really it's a mixed CIRM CERD hybrid that is already approved in Europe for osteoporosis. It has shown activity in tamoxifen resistant xenograft models and also showed improved potency against ESR1 mutant when compared to tamoxifen. It is currently being evaluated in combination with palbociclib in ER positive heteronegative metastatic breast cancer. What about CIRCA? serum estrogen receptor covalent antagonist. These target a unique cysteine, C530, in wild type and mutant ER that are not conserved in other nuclear hormone receptors. Now, H3P6545 is the first in-class CERCA developed by H3 Biomedicine, a subsidiary of ESI, that binds with ER irreversibly and enforces a novel antagonist conformation without degrading the ER. It appears to have increased efficacy in combination with palbociclib. It is already evaluated in a phase one trial. Here are the patient demographics from that trial. Of the 94 patients, these patients had received median of three prior lines of therapies. About a third of these patients had four or more lines of therapies, including 85% with prior CDK4-6 inhibitor. About 70% had prior fulvestrant and 50% had prior chemotherapy. About a third of these patients had ESR1 mutations detected at baseline. And in the, um, this treatment um, with H3P6545 at 450 milligram dose led to an overall response rate of 17% and clinical benefit rate of 40%. The median PFS in all patients was about 5.1 months. And in the 10 patients with clonal Y537S mutations, median PFS was 7.3 months. With respect to safety, grade two or higher adverse events of anemia, GI side effects, elevated LFTs, and bradycardia and QTC prolongation have been reported with this trial. In fact, a combination of H3P6545 plus palbociclib was presented at, as a poster earlier today in about 22 patients where they established the safety with two doses, um, two dose cohorts at lower doses of H3P6545 at 300 milligrams and established the similar safety profile with higher uh, neutropenia rates as expected. And there is also activity seen despite prior CDK4-6 inhibitor therapy. 
So what is the key takeaway from no novel serums in Circa? That lasofloxifene, basidoxifene, and H3B6545, they modulate the ER. They do not necessarily degrade the ER. There is activity either expected or seen in both ESR1 wild type and mutant patients. There's advantage for novel serums or CERDs with respect to their safety profile. It's already established to have um, a better safety profile with respect to sexual side effects or bone health. And we still need more efficacy and safety data from larger trials. We just have early data from phase one studies at this point. Now what about complete estrogen receptor antagonist or CRAN? We know that tamoxifen is not a complete antagonist. And preclinical data has suggested that ER degradation alone might not be enough to necessarily inhibit ER signaling and that we might need full antagonism. And OP1250 is a complete estrogen receptor um, antagonist, which is first in class. And data from a, from a ongoing phase one trial, the phase one, a dose escalation portion was presented as a poster again today by Erica Hamilton. And of these 40 patients that were treated with this molecule, 50% had ESR1 mutations at baseline. About 50% had more than three lines of endocrine therapy. About 70% had prior full vestrant and 73% had prior chemotherapy. 90% had prior CDK4-6 inhibitor therapy. And in the dose cohorts that were anticipated to be the recommended phase two dose of 60 to 120 milligrams, the overall response rate reported was 18% and clinical benefit rate of 38% activity seen including in ESR1 mutant patients. With respect to safety, however, the safety profile included grade one to nausea, fatigue, grade one for topsy or flashing lights, grade one asymptomatic bradycardia, and grade three for neutropenia. Last but not the least, we'll review proteolysis targeting Chimera or PROTAC. Now PROTAC have ligands for one, the hormone receptor itself, so in this case, the estrogen receptor, and they have another ligand for E3 ubiquitin ligase. And so when PROTAC binds to the hormone receptor, it then recruits the E3 ubiquitin ligase complex, and this leads to polyubiquitination of the ER, leading to degradation via the proteasome. Now, what is nice here is that these PROTACs can cause complete inhibition of this ER and full antagonism of this ER, and it does not cause any conformational changes of this ER, does not modulate it. Only a small amount of PROTAC or a weak amount of PROTAC is required to bind with the, um, the hormone receptor, and that itself is enough to tag it for degradation. And so these protacs can undergo multiple rounds of activity, and therefore they can remove even small substoichiometric quantities of proteins. Adovinus had um, this first-in-molecule, first-in-class molecule ARV471, and a phase one trial. The, in a phase one trial, the patient characteristics are shown here on this slide, where all patients had received prior CDK4-6 inhibitor therapy, 70% had prior full Western therapy, 38% had chemo. And interestingly, about a quarter of these patients had also progressed on prior investigational oral CERT therapy for a median prior lines of five therapies. And despite this heavily pretreated patient population, including prior CDK4-6 and uh, investigational certs, the clinical benefit rate here was 42% in this trial. It was rather well tolerated with most common toxicities being grade one to nausea, arthralgia, fatigue, and some decreased appetite. We will hear updated results from this uh, study at, um, on Friday. Erica Hamilton will present the updated results uh, at a poster on Friday, so watch out for that data. So key take, take away from our CRAN and PROTAX is that OP1250 and ARV471 do not modulate the ER. They are ER antagonists, and in fact, ARV471 can also degrade the ER. They both have shown activity post full vestrant, post CDK4-6, and in fact, one might think that perhaps PROTAC might also be active post oral surge. However, the activity and the safety profile that we've seen to date with both these agents needs to be confirmed in larger trials. And we also need to understand what kind of mechanisms of resistance these agents might have. So in conclusions, the ultimate selection of all these novel endocrine agents that are currently in development will be dependent on their optimal therapeutic index and their efficacy. What we've seen from these phase one trials is that they're effective after full vestrant and CDK4-6 inhibitor therapy, and in patients whose tumors harbor mutant ESR1 mutation. 
oral certs are the furthest in development and may have the potential to replace current approved endocrine therapy in the second or third line setting post CDK4-6 inhibitor therapy. At least based on the Emerald trial, it was apparent that progression-free survival is higher in those patients whose tumor harbor mut mutant ESR1, and PFS rates were higher at the six and the 12 month time point. We do await data from the other CERDs in this space, and also for combinations with PI3K AKT mTOR inhibitors in the second line setting. They are rapidly being evaluated in the first line setting in combination with CDK4-6, and also being evaluated in early state setting but the activity of the other um, novel agents and the safety have to be conferred in larger trials. And I'll leave you with this big picture question that we wanna think about is that, how do we figure out a way to optimally sequence these agents to further improve outcomes for our patients? And how will cost really impact their utility for our patients as well, both in late stage and early stage settings? And one thing that we have learned from these agents is that while they can address one mechanism of endocrine resistance, which is ESR1 mutation, we do require other agents and potentially other combinations to tackle the ligand binding domain mutation independent mechanisms of endocrine resistance. With that, I'd really like to thank um, all my friends and colleagues, to our patients and their families who really inspire us in doing what we do every day. And thank you all for your attention.